Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Uh, today I want to talk to you about the Jazz Cannon. What is the Jazz Cannon? And for a lot of people, it, it simply is what they know. And as your knowledge grows, your understanding of the canon grows. But I think for a lot of people, it's very misdefined. And <clears throat> I certainly think that my initial perspectives of what the jazz canon is and what I see it as now are very different. It's certainly not a refined matter. There's a lot of uh, <clears throat> open-endedness to this debate. But uh, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the qualifications for being part of the canon. Uh, first of all, sustainability is important. You still have to be recognized today. However, your ability to sell records today doesn't define your canon status. There's a lot of artists today that are in print and very much in demand and being purchased that in a lot of ways are outside of the canon. <clears throat> so much of what our reissue market is is printing the rare and hard to find pieces and they aren't mutually exclusive you can be rare and hard to find and be part of the canon but you can also be highly in demand today and not be part of the canon and you can also have been a major part of the past and not in demand today and be absolutely in the canon and let's start with Duke Ellington in that case uh, Ellington is the songbook of jazz he is probably the most important figure in the codifying of what jazz is and he didn't use that word to define himself he made Duke Ellington music and it's really broad in its scope but it always swings it's always got an element of sexual tension spiritual confirmation uh, musicality uh, brilliant composition absolutely brilliant arrangement <clears throat> part of great composition <clears throat> is great arrangement and uh, you don't get that the same way in a trio or a quartet that you do in a bigger ensemble like a Basie or an Ellington group and arrangements very important because it allows you to create movement and counter movement it allows you to create melody and counter melody. It allows you to create uh, obligato, staccato, uh, crescendo, diminuendo, all these different effects that are part of the music lexicon that the classical European tradition utilizes all the time. It's harder to establish those trends, traits, and behaviors in a, in a trio. There's just not the room, the breadth, the dimension. In a larger ensemble, you could have a rhythm section being soft with a horn section being bright. You can have a, a reed section being angled and then a low brass section being rounded. You could have so many different sorts of conflict and resolution within a piece. And so arrangement is a byproduct of composition, and it's a byproduct of being a, a great songwriter. But there's a whole other step that arranging brings to the fore. And if you listen to something like Benny Goodman's Sing, 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 which I believe was arranged by Fletcher Henderson and written by uh, Prima, Louis Prima, if I recall. I could be wrong on that, but uh, the arrangements in that are as integral to the dynamics of it and the spectacular fireworks show that that is as is the composition in itself. So arrangement is a very important piece of the puzzle when it comes to musical uh, delivery and how I'm going to get my message across. And Ellington is the master. He's just the master of creating a mood that minimal just it just draws you in it's intriguing 
It's full of mystery. It's full of suspense. It's full of confrontation. It's full of education. It's full of love. It's full of anger. It's, it's got so much emotional stock woven within its fabric. And he never ceased to be the jazz songbook. All the greats do Ellington songs. Solitude, track after track after track are just ubiquitous in today's language. And you see and hear a lot of these songs still being performed today when you go to a little jazz club. And so I think in spite of the fact that today's collector doesn't value Ellington, his body of work is the nucleus of the jazz canon. <clears throat> and you can't take the American songbook and say that, even though the songbook was covered extensively by the jazz community, Ellington is the jazz songbook. He is the proving ground that most jazz musicians have learned dozens of pieces of his. And it's just a standard that you know you don't show up to the club and not have an idea how to play numerous Ellington songs. Uh, this is, of course, the fantastic music uh, from the soundtrack of the most picture, Anatomy of a Murder. Uh, it's kind of a budget reissue from Columbia that happened probably in the 80s this came out. I'd like to get an original someday, but my I have probably close to 50 Ellington pieces. And it's a very convoluted thing because a lot of it comes from the 78 era. So you got to get collections to get that stuff. And then in the 50s, he's putting out new material. Columbia's reissuing old stock material, Capital reprise. Uh, there's Deca, there's a lot of different labels that are putting out Ellington pieces. And so it's a very convoluted body of work. But uh, I promise you, you will not regret ever purchasing an Ellington record and you'll never have to pay big bucks for it. It's always gonna be an affordable uh, entry into your collection. And in spite of what today's collectors tell you, in spite of all the heads on YouTube talking about what's important in jazz, Ellington is as important as anything in the jazz canon. Get all that avant-garde shit out of your eyes and out of your ears and listen to Ellington first before you even try to grasp Eric Dolphy. Because it's Ellington's compositions that take interesting instruments like oboes and bassoons and bass clarinets and utilize them in, in interesting, inspiring ways that makes a guy like Dolphy come along and say, you know what, I'm gonna take the bassoon or the oboe and do some interesting shit with it. Yusuf Latif, you can't tell me Yusuf Latif didn't take all of what he heard in Ellington and start establishing all these world instruments into his sound. Uh, Coltrane himself, one of the great pushers of the music, does an incredible record with Duke Ellington. And it's one of the great records on the canon. So the canon isn't just defined by what's being bought today. In fact, it's a very poor representation of what the jazz canon looks like. So it's important to grasp that the today's collector, today's reviewer, is giving a very narrow scope of what they perceive the canon to be. And it's as important to have sold well at the time to establish your credentials as it is to still be in demand today. And both elements have their weight. A guy like Mobley didn't sell very good in his lifetime at all, but now he's firmly become one of the stars of the jazz canon as we look back on his bluesy, absolutely filled with integrity, brilliant playing. He wasn't pushing the boundaries, so a lot of the avant-garde guys and a lot of the guys who are so hip, I haven't heard Mobley and Dig it because he's not making you go, he, but he's, he's doing what he feels. There's such an honesty to Hank Mobley. And so he's an absolutely a huge important part of the canon. So next to Duke Ellington, you gotta put Miles Davis' body of work probably second. And again, this is gonna be a loose list. It's not gonna be super uh, well-defined, but Miles Davis' body of work covers a lot of eras. And in his constellations are a lot of really big stars. 
And if you get to know Miles Davis career arc, you will in that process discover a lot of the greats from early on with guys like Parker and Dizzy to a little later with guys like uh, Max Roach and Sonny Rollins uh, to his work with guys like Lucky Thompson to his first great quintet, his second quintet. All the guys in between those guys had important moments in jazz history. Even his work into the fusion era where I'm on record for saying Bitches Brew is not as important as people think it is. It's a hard listen for most people, and I think a lot of people fake it because they've been told their whole life it's such an important seminal record. And if you don't like it, it's okay because it's not an easy listen. It's dissonant, it's unresolved, it's full of tension, it's very little groove or pocket. People are talking over each other, there's no listening going on. It's not nearly as important a record as most people would have you believe. Uh, yet, for most rock and roll people, it's an entry point. And it borrows so much from the rock and roll concept that for most rock and roll fans, Bitches Brew makes perfect sense. But you spend a lot of time listening to black music, R&B, jazz, the blues. There's a lot in Bitches Brew that ain't that. A lot of people talking at the same time. A lot of... A lack of space. A lack of room to breathe. A lack of... Um, the bass and the drums locking in and giving you a pattern that you can just tap your foot and nod your head to. But again, Miles Davis' career is so expansive and introduces you to so many other great stars. And it covers such a long time frame from the late 40s with his work with Parker to into the 80s where he's mixing hip hop with jazz. And there's a lot of misses, you know, a lot of lesser records. And there's a dozen infamous records that you couldn't have a jazz collection without but Miles at his best and his worst is going to draw you in and teach you about a lot of the history and unfortunately he's become so the black hole center of the galaxy to most people's jazz perspectives today that it's really distorted a lot of the views of the rest of the jazz universe which is a little bit unfortunate but Miles' body of work I have probably 75 records of him as a leader, and there's some stuff as a sideman as well, but uh, it does cover a long era and a lot of different uh, of the movements in jazz, the innovations. Not necessarily that were driven by him. He helped publicize a lot of that innovation though. Uh, number three, I'm gonna talk about Count Basie. I talk about Basie quite a lot. He is such the architect of space minimalism and sometimes the less notes that i hit you with the more impact those notes can have and a flurry of punches might have some impact but a couple really well placed dukes can knock you out i can put a whole lot more punch power behind a few punches than I can by just hitting that bag over and over again. And Basie re understood and recognized the architecture of space and the volumes within the architecture are as important as the walls that hold that space together. And so he was fine with just adding little trills and finding just a little pattern that that great rhythm section would just lay down and that incredible band would fill in the pieces in between. And Basie's body of work is also immense. Uh, a lot of it's also pre-war and 78 era, so it's gonna be on collections on various different labels once again, which makes it tough for the collector to appreciate and get to understand and know very well. And his body of work post-1950, his Verve Clef stuff is outstanding. His stuff on roulette is fiery. The band is incredible. And then he moves back to Verve and does some really well polished produced sessions for Creed Taylor in the 60s. That's also really well made and accessible and easy to find. 
and those records shouldn't be diminished in people's minds. For those of you who want a little bit more uh, edge to your music, Monk is an incredibly important part of the jazz canon. Uh, he's early works at Blue Note took kind of years for people to digest and appreciate, but they've become quite seminal and very important in people's understandings of the music today. And he moves over to Prestige in the mid early 50s and makes some great recordings there with Sonny Rollins and uh, Oscar Petterford. And then he moves to Riverside where he makes a string of outstanding records that pushes the fabric of the music as broad as Ellington did in a much smaller group setting. And with Monk, it's amazing how much arrangement he gets in the small group settings. And you don't get that in hard bop. You don't get that in even the modal sense. Even the blues, the blues isn't about arrangement. The blues is about feeling. The blues is about just the gut speaking. Arrangement's more cerebral. It's more creating an emotional response through the colors and tempos and counter movements and edges of the song and the arrangements and the and the chords and the notes. And Monk will have you think. Monk will have you think. Monk will have you delving and diving deeper into the song, trying to grasp where exactly is this set. And Monk's music is definitely a huge part of the jazz canon and it's pretty well respected today across the board from his earliest works right through into his later stuff with the Columbia Big Bands and the Palo Alto concert that just came out is fantastic. I was really impressed by that. But Monk's absolutely a guy whose body of work is very integral to the jazz canon. Uh, John Coltrane, the biggest limitation to his body of work is the limitations of the time frame. He shows up as a sideman as early as the late 40s, but it's not really until 56, 57 where he starts making a real impact as a leader. And by 67, he's passed away. So it's a short window, but there's no question most of his body of work is pretty firmly in the jazz canon still to this day. Most of it stays in pretty high demand still to this day. Uh, he does some stuff that pushes the boundaries you know, and you certainly don't have to have Ascension or Ohm in your collection if that's not your thing. Uh, and those records are probably on the cusp of the, of the canon, to be honest. They are not as invitational as most jazz is and should be. The music is driven and derived from the enticing nature of sexuality and groove and a good time that's the whole allure is what are they playing in there that sounds exciting if you've never heard the groove of this music before and you're strolling down a street in New Orleans or Kansas City in 1937 and the sounds creeping out of the basement of some little nightclub it's so fresh it's so driven. It's so sexual. And that power, that enticing nature, it's a real big part of what jazz is. And so jazz that doesn't entice, jazz that doesn't have that allure to it, that repels people, <clears throat> it's just not as important and not as big a part of the canon as people today want to think it is. And for the most part, to me, 80% of the avant-garde is outside of the jazz canon. And that might not be a popular thing to say, but it's just the truth. It didn't sell for a reason. It wasn't fun. It was self-indulgent. It was self-introspective. It didn't consider its audience. It didn't consider even its bandmates at times. It was just very much driven by my own need to extrapolate on my own ideas and abandon structure, arrangement, melody, groove on some self-indulgent plunge into the mystery and the unknown. Uh, jazz, the avant-garde has its moments 
and certain artists do it really well. A guy like Mingus uh, is certainly a part of the jazz canon, and I wouldn't say all of his work uh, is necessarily going to be embraced by everyone. And some of his candid pieces, I don't think they're necessarily as important as, say, Pithecanthropus or Mingus Aum or even uh, his piano works on Impulse. That's gorgeous, wonderful. Uh, anybody can appreciate that. Black Satan, the Sinner Lady. Uh, he has a lot of important pieces and he takes a lot from both Monk and from Ellington and pushes a lot of boundaries but kind of always manages to resolve and find the tonic and getting us back to a place where our body can breathe and relax. Uh, but there's just so many great artists that are Milt Jackson, his work with the MJQ and his work as a solo artist he pushes and professes the blues throughout his career a phenomenal long career uh, Kenny Burrell, just a large body of work that's a super impressive part of the canon. And so what makes something part of the canon? It's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to define in a lot of ways, but I look at the longevity of a career, the impact it has on those players around him, and how many people end up emulating that sound or that innovation you look at how it's time treated said artist and sometimes time has diminished an artist that it shouldn't have other times time has escalated an artist that it didn't need to but the canon is a big unbounded volume you know it's thousands and thousands and thousands of records and then you start talking the 78 era and you're talking thousands and thousands of songs so it's a tough thing to define. And a lot of it, for a lot of people, it's what I know. And that's a pretty narrow scope. And there's a lot more to it than just saying, all oh, the jazz canons, these artists, because this is what I've been taught and listened to. There's entire label discographies that are part of the canon. Pretty much everything on Verve is the canon. Uh, Coleman Hawkins, Sweets Edison, Roy Eldridge, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, all those fantastic records that came out in the 50s, Holiday, Fitzgerald, uh, Teddy Wilson. There's so many fantastic records that are in the $5 to $10, $15 range that are absolutely rooted firmly in the jazz canon that the modern collector doesn't give a shit about. Because all these people in the, in the vinyl community are just talking about this rare piece that got reissued and you can't find the originals for less than $500, that's because the original wasn't part of the canon to begin with. And we have to stop listening to a lot of these people who don't have a broad, broad enough scope. And sadly, some of the most knowledgeable people I know don't want to be on YouTube and don't have any interest in even talking to me on YouTube. My friend Scott Baldwin, this guy knows the canon. He knows the canon, but he doesn't really have an interest in... Uh, it's not about not caring to share it. It's more about he's just not comfortable doing it. But like this guy, when he posts records on Facebook, he knows so much. So many artists that are forgotten and labels even that are forgotten. He's a real uh, source for me to talk to about uh, titles and uh, to validate or to conflict with something I assume or think. He's a great sounding board. Uh, and then there's the whole European uh, sphere that is, there's a whole nother set of canon from over there that is outside of the American canon, but it's still a part of the jazz canon. And it's, again, it's very expansive. It's a very, very broad uh, assemblage of pieces. Sonny Rollins is another very integral part of the jazz canon. Uh, his movements and adaptations, his removal of the pianist, his use of Jim Hall and the guitar, he is just a very interesting player who plays with a lot of fire and ferocity but stays very centered. His flame is very hot and it's always structured around groove and the blues and he didn't 
he he rather would walk away from the music at times than just blindly follow the trends as they were. And when Ornette comes along and Coltrane starts pushing the boundaries, I'm sure there was a part of Rollins that said, oh, I need to follow. But he'd rather, he, he walked away instead. It didn't feel true to him. He had to find his own way. He had to find his own sound. And that's a lot of integrity talking. That's a lot of honesty. And again, honesty is one of the most important things to look for in this world, in this life. Tell me something that's honest. Give me the truth. I want to know the truth. And I can't stand the deceit of lyrics because they're very dishonest. And a lot of musicians are very much posers going through the permutations to get people to think they're something. And again, the avant-garde thing is really guilty of that. There's so many guys in there that just started honking their horns to be part of a scene and it doesn't make any of it great. You know, the for every Eric Dolphy, there's a dozen guys out there honking that should have remained forgotten. You know, uh, Cecil Taylor is a guy that I struggle with. Uh, he even has a couple Blue Note titles. Unit structures I find unlistenable. Uh, it's it's so dense. It's so chaotic. It's it spirals out of control, and it's it's not a fun listen. I can't remember the last time I made it through a side of that record. Even when I play it to talk about it in one of my episodes, I'm just like, man, how has this become? in a lot of people's minds, a very desired piece. It's a very weird piece that's a film that you would watch once every 10 years and be like, ah, I'm not gonna watch that again for a long time. It's a weird assemblage of parts. Uh, I think some people try too hard to think they get it. And I think I was guilty of that for a long time. Like, oh, I understand this avant-garde, I'm so complex. My maturity and my sophistication as a musician means I get it. You just don't get it. If you listen to it ten more times, you'll get bitches brew. If I eat something two times and don't like it, I ain't gonna keep trying to eat it. And I listened to bitches brew hundreds of times and thought I loved it for a long time. But when it really came down to it, I really sat and listened to it and it really was more objective about it, what it was telling me, what it was making me feel, the places it was coming from. It seemed very self-indulgent, selfish, and dishonest. And there's a lot of ego being stretched out in that record and a whole lot less feel. It's trying to be something. It's trying to sound hip, sound new. And it's something you can't force. Monk didn't force what he did. It just comes out natural. Parker didn't force Bebop. He just saw through the numbers and revolutionized how we play. Armstrong was never fake a day in his life. He was never trying to reinvent singing and playing and lyricism and rhythm and tone and redefine his instrument. He wasn't trying to do those things. He just did. And I think that's important to grasp. Because the integrity of the artist, the integrity of the music, that has a lot to say about where it fits in the jazz canon. And so we're going to exclude the stuff from pre-war. It's all out there on LP in various collections. And to be honest, my grasp of a lot of it isn't as strong outside of the Ellingtons and, and, uh, you know, there's Basies. There's, there's guys I know, Benny Goodman's, but I don't know a lot of the artists like I could or should. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. Uh, there's a lot from that era, and a lot of it's very important roots of what ends up happening post-war. But when you look at the post-war years, the Savoy body of work from the 40s is a hugely important part of the canon. It really is. And the Savoy stuff into the early 50s and the mid 50s is very key. A lot of good things are happening with Herman Lubinsky's Savoy records. Uh, 
There's a lot of other small labels around like Dial that are doing some good things as well with Parker and with the music, but those record, those labels haven't really left their impact the same way. Uh, Prestige is a very important label and not just because of Miles Davis. Uh, Saxophone Colossus is one of the great records of all time. Red Garland's works on that label are very, to me, wonderful. Monk's stuff on Prestige is very fantastic. Uh, the New Jazz Prestige Affiliate is doing some really cutting edge stuff. 58, 59, 60. So you look at Prestige, they're definitely a part of the canon. And there's some titles you would omit that haven't made it through the test of time, but most prestige titles have. Blue Note is absolutely the canon. Uh, I would say their tenant chair is not, because a lot of that stuff wasn't even recorded by Blue Note. It was licensed from Vogue in Paris, and it's just really, they're trying to f find their way at that point. And I'd say the same thing about Riverside's tenant chair. It's not necessarily jazz canon stuff. There's some good pieces there, like the Randy Weston, but a lot of it's trying to find its way and then Blue Note going into the 12-inch 1500 series is pretty much solid canon. Pretty much through to 67 in the sale, Blue Note makes seminal recordings that are always hallmarks and high watermarks for what was happening at that moment. Uh, Riverside, starting about 1958 to about 1962, is one of the most important labels in the canon. Their body of work should absolutely be seen as hallowed ground. Uh, the Verve body of work from the Clef Norgrand days through into the Creed Taylor days is absolutely jazz canon stuff. The Creed Taylor era has some jazz canon stuff, but it also has a lot of pop, jazz, bright, arranged uh, records that sold well. Some of that Cal Jader stuff is fantastic. Uh, Kai Winding stuff, even some of the Jimmy Smith stuff, West Montgomery, but I'm not sure a lot of it's in the canon. It's more part of uh, a pop crossover canon, perhaps, than it is the strict sense of the jazz canon. Uh, jazz needs to be layered with feeling. And Creed Taylor somehow strips feeling away with too much polish, too much premeditation and there's a fine line between rehearsal and coming to a place of unity emotionally versus premeditated production and it's a fine line and it, it, it's it's tough to really demarcate it but it's still there and I can tell you some of that later verse stuff which I love and play a lot when I DJ but I wouldn't say it's jazz can stuff it's just it's fueled by a different engine. Uh, Argo has some fantastic stuff in the canon, and a lot of their stuff's very obscure, which makes it probably not part of the canon, but it's all very rooted in the blues and rooted in the, in the heart and soul of the feeling of the canon. Emercy is absolutely firmly rooted in the canon. 53, 4 through about 58, they do a lot of incredible work that to me is firmly part of the canon. Uh, Impulse, it's more hit and miss than you would think. It really is. There's some pretty fluffy stuff and unimportant Impulse records. The collegiate band jam records, The there's just some weird Barbara Jenkins and just some of it's like, what were you thinking? The Russian Jazz Quartet that was obviously kind of politically motivated uh, in a Cold War sensibility. Uh, again, Impulse has more misses than you would think for as hallowed as we see it nowadays. Atlantic Records has some incredible records in the canon, but again, there's a lot of stuff that's more rooted in R&B and even in the blues, and they are very progressive and willing to really trust their musicians, but it's 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 an interesting debate, you know. Uh, we could probably go through the shelves and just talk about the various artists and labels. Uh, Bethlehem, a label I love and talk about a lot. 
And I'll have to admit, some of it's not part of the jazz canon. Uh, a lot of it's product. Uh, it's forward thinking. It's interesting, but it's certainly uh, intended for a different audience. Uh, I'd say some of it definitely is, but some of the Bethlehem stuff is very poppy and approaches easy listening pop, especially some of the vocal stuff. Uh, Adderley is a super important part of the canon. It's it's going to be too difficult to kind of go through artist by artist here, but the canon is an important thing for us to grasp and to try to define it. And Blakey is probably one of the greatest examples of the jazz canon. And from his early work, uh, the live Blue Note stuff, to his time at Columbia in 56, to the 57, 58 period where he shows up on like six different labels from Bethlehem to Pacific Records to, he's just all over the map there. Then he comes back to Blue Note and he establishes the sound of hard bop with Horace Silver, and that body of work into the late 60s is just incredible blues-driven, feeling-driven uh, arrangement is always present in those groups, but it never takes over. Uh, virtuosity is important in those groups, but it never dictates. Uh, Blakey doesn't allow nothing to drive the group besides the groove and the thundering, pulsing power of Blakey and his rhythm sections, whether it was Silver, whether it was uh, Bobby Timmons. It, it, that was just Cedar Wall. It didn't matter. It has to be pulsing and grooving and in your face. And it can be intricate, but it's got to have feeling. And... I think feeling is ultimately the greatest measuring stick for what's in the canon. And if I had to define it with one thing, it often comes down to when I sit and listen to the record and I'm not trying to force what I think about, or I'm just kind of drifting off thinking about, okay, I'm going to make dinner, and then something hits me from the music. What it makes me feel, what it makes me think, that's a super important part of understanding what the canon is. And that music that hits you in the gut and demands your attention and expresses the experience of those who are making it, that's a fairly good indication of where the canon is and lies. And whether you're talking about Ellington or Coltrane, those guys always transcend in that kind of a sense. Uh, it's, a, it's a broad body of work. You know, it really is. There's a lot of the West Coast stuff. Uh, Chet Baker's firmly in the canon. A white guy with a drug problem who could tell a lot of great stories. He plays with the blues. He plays with sorrow. He plays a, a lyrical trumpet that you can't help but weep to. That's an important, honest expression. And again, honesty is such an important part of emoting. And if I'm emoting and it's pretentious, or it's uh, phony, that doesn't stand the test of time. It just doesn't. Uh, the Roos label makes a lot of great records that are firmly in the canon. Uh, and you look up most of the great jazz guys, especially from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it'll give you a pretty good idea where the canon is and the labels that house those guys are doing a great job sharing the canon with the masses. But it, like I said, it's a, it's a tough bundle to get your arms and head around. And it's certainly much broader than just our concepts of what it is today and what collectors are buying today. And you'd be very misinformed if you looked at what the average record store stocks and sells and can't keep in the shelves. And if you think that's the jazz canon, you're reading a book that's missing most of its chapters. And if you think you understand the book by reading three chapters and you're missing 17, 
You ain't got a clue. You just don't. It's a very small window that the modern collector has available to him in the reissue programs and being promoted broadly by the industry. It's a small, small percentage of the great body of work that is jazz. And the pre-war stuff is equally important. It's just a tougher thing to grasp. And I don't think most of today's collectors are even not willing to go back into the 40s and 50s, let alone the 20s and 30s. So we try to keep our focus more on the 50s and 60s where my love and passion really lies. And <clears throat> I'm going to go on a limb here. And I'm going to say that there's very little jazz from the 70s and the 80s that I think is part of the canon. And there's great music that comes out from that era. Uh, there's a lot of great Concord stuff that's very traditional. Uh, Dexter Gordon makes a great comeback. Uh, uh, Frank Morgan's comeback on Contemporary in the 80s. There's some great stuff happening, you know, but it's a bit like the classics in literature. All that stuff that was written in Latin, that's the canon in some ways. And you can write a book today in Latin, but that's not going to make you a classic. And just because you're using that language that died, it might make you knowledgeable and you might be paying homage and a tribute to it, but it doesn't make you a part of that. It'd be a bit like trying to write the 67th book of the Bible. Good luck. Good luck. And you're just as likely to be a cult leader if you go on thinking that as you are to ever be part of that great assemblage that is the Bible. So, again, a lot of it's the conceptions and perceptions of each collector. And my perception of the canon changes all the time and keeps getting broader and also it chisels off some of the pieces that I don't think are in there and this isn't just my opinion I've talked with a lot of people about these things over the years and trying to quantify just exactly what the canon is and looks like and I think it's an important thing to grasp because I think more people would collect more of it if we put more emphasis on the Holy of Holies and that chosen body of work. And to be honest, there's a lot of great work in the jazz canon that's out there for under 20 bucks still. There really is. And a lot of the stuff that's fetching 500 bucks ain't part of the canon. A lot of that rare, obscure, small labels had no impact. It didn't sell in the time. It was on some label nobody heard of. It was so small and niche that it doesn't have a place. It's, again, it doesn't make it good or bad. There's a lot of fine music there that's not part of the canon, per se. I said there's a lot of Bethlehem stuff that I love that I wouldn't say is in the jazz canon. Dick Wetmore, fun record. Not in the jazz canon. You know, so it's just because you like something doesn't make it canon. And just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's not part of the canon. But I think one of the most important elements to grasp is that connection to the blues, that connection to swing, and how it makes you feel. And for the most part, Jazz is supposed to make you feel good, happy, joy, uh, overcoming. That's the language that this is written in. It's in spite of the fires all around my village, this is a place of solace. And I want you as my audience to feel my peace right now. And if you're lucky, you can take my peace and listen to it and fill your head and your ears with it and your soul with it and also find some peace while your village is burning.
And so it makes it really tough for me to listen to something that's just chaotic and full of cacophony. And how do we define that as jazz? How does that fill those definitions? It's not sexual. It's not danceable. It's not calming. It's... It's very self-indulgent against all of the, the concepts and notions of what this music is and what it was defined as. So I appreciate some feedback and some insight and let me know what you guys think. How do you define the jazz canon? And I think a lot of people define it far too narrow just as what they know and anything beyond what they know or have heard of ain't part of it. But again, I'm coming from a place where I have a lot of the labels completed or nearly completed from those 20 years and so I think I have a fairly good base from which to look at what's canon and what's not uh, there's always room to move stuff around there's always room to adjust the parameters but again it's just my take based off a lot of great conversations with a lot of people and I'll say this there's a lot of stuff being posted in today's Facebook jazz groups and social media that no one even noticed when it came out. It's just not part of the canon. And there's a lot of stuff that's in the canon that no one today even gives a shit about. And I think that's what I'm trying to get across. Is, boy, there's a lot of great jazz out there for a good price. And we too many of us allow price to, to dictate if something's important or not. And I can't think of a shallower way to be an archaeologist. I can't think of a way you can grasp less than what a culture has to tell you. Then the only value, the rare, complete artifacts that came towards the end of a civilization, and that's why they, it just, it doesn't ring true. An archaeologist would cherish a shard of a piece of pottery because of what it tells them about a people. And so these people who are out there going, all oh, the spine was cracked, and I couldn't deceive this, and there was... What are you talking about? Who buys a record only to listen to the cracks in the spine and the tape on the back and the water? Who gives a fuck? It's 70 years old. It's telling me something about the world they lived in. It's expressing how they felt about the world at the time and how their soul dealt with all that experience and so I think we should help our, each other and encourage people to look at records that cost five six eight ten twelve fifteen dollars and see that they're just as important as the two hundred dollar record and sometimes more so and for all that's good in this world let's stop determining the value of a record by how much it costs because it just has no bearing on what it means or what its real value is it just doesn't and sometimes something is rare because it sucked because it sucked and it doesn't make you so hip because you get it it means that you pay a lot and so you're trying hard to defend that purchase and I was that guy a long time. I speak in, from experience. I, I know. I know how it feels to spend $200, 100, 150 bucks, on, and be like, oh, this has to be so important. It costs so much. And then only to be disappointed in the long frame of things. So anyway, I'm the Josh Shepard. My name is Dan. Y'all be safe. Y'all be peace. In the comments below, tell me what you think the canon is in your mind. And maybe if we get enough comments, we can come to some kind of a consensus and try to grasp what it truly does look like. Uh, there's no debate about who's really at the top of that list. And where it goes from there, that's to be determined. And let's just be clear, liking something doesn't make it canon. Let's just make sure we got that concept. Oh, I love this record. That don't make it canon. It just doesn't. You can love a book by some artist. Doesn't mean it's part of the literature canon. 
You know, it's a very different thing. To be part of the canon, you have to have had an influence on your peers, been uh, imitated, been... It's just, it's just, it's a different thing. So let's hear what you think, what your definitions of the jazz canon are, what you think should be, what you think shouldn't be. And by all means, don't allow what a record costs to define for you what the canon is. And one last thought on Record Store Day. As collectible and as expensive as some of that stuff has gotten, doesn't make any of it part of the jazz canon. You could take some snippets and outtakes of some Shakespeare play and release that little compendium of the Shakespeare outtakes. That's not part of the canon. Macbeth is. Romeo and Juliet, sure as hell. But a collection of snippets and little... It's not. It's just not. And so spending $70 on some reissued live recording that has very little merit. Don't let the people who are selling it to you convince you that this is some sacred ground. Because that Coltrane record from a couple years ago, it's not canon. It's outtakes. And it's okay, but it's not going to blow your mind away. And that's one of the better examples. Because there's a lot of stuff that out there that's far less important and as much as these jazz musicians played and as much as they recorded having one new live recording pop up by one of them it's we got to measure our excitement and i know sometimes these new collectors it's hard to find the old stuff you know and we think oh we're being part of the, the cutting edge of the new discoveries and we feel like we're getting in on some secret on the ground floor. But there's a lot of charlatans out there. So I'm leave it at that. Dig out what you think is your canon, what you think it defines. Let me know. Peace. <laughs>